You are listening to Living the Clover Life. Welcome back to our new series on vocation discernment. I'm Father Sean Danda, and we decided to do this series on vocation discernment because there are a lot of people out there that are trying to figure out, you know, what does God want me to do with my life? And how do I figure that out? How do I come to know his will, follow my vocation, or even actively discern my vocation? So we're going to look at some different vocations. And today I have with me Jenny and Joe Zunick. Hello. Hello. And we're going to talk about the vocation of marriage and their discernment. So let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, you have called each one of us to marry you. And you have given us the gift of marriage as a sign of our end in heaven, that we would be united with you by the holiness and love and devotion of married couples. May they continue to wit give witness to how you love us and desire to be one with us in the heavenly kingdom. We ask this all through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So for some people thinking about marriage, maybe there's that misnomer that it's not a vocation, just vocations are for priests and religious, but that's not true. We're all called to the vocation of holiness, and God then calls us to a very particular vocation. For some people, like myself, that is to be a priest. For my sister, it was to become a nun. Uh, but for the vast majority of people, it is to the married state. Jesus has elevated the vocation, the call of marriage from the natural realm of how God created Adam and Eve in his own image and likeness and formed a covenant with them from the very beginning. But Jesus elevates this for Christians to become a sacrament, a sign of his grace, of his mercy, of his love. And we think about how in John's gospel, how Jesus called himself the bridegroom. Who has he come to marry? His bride, the church. And how his first miracle was at the wedding of Cana in Galilee. And now whenever he speaks about heaven, what is heaven like? It's like a marriage feast that a father has thrown for his son who has married his bride. And the wedding guests are gathering to celebrate this great event. And so marriage in the Christian mind is a great, great vocation. So why don't you guys tell us a little bit about, you know, how did you guys fall in love and get married and all that fun stuff? So I, uh, I'm a hopeless romantic, so I've always uh, been drawn towards uh, marriage, love, love stories, love songs. I love all that stuff. Uh, I dated around and uh, could never really find that person. So I went to uh, an option that was kind of new at the time. Yeah, now it's quite common. <laughs> yeah, now it's common. It wasn't back then. It was kind of still weird. But uh, so I, I joined uh, eHarmony and it was the first time I'd done that. And actually the first person I met on that was my beautiful wife, Jennifer. We, we hit it off. Um, I actually knew after our first date that we were, well, I had, I didn't know for sure, but I had a intuition that she was the one. So we had our date. And uh, when I got home, I wrote a letter basically saying uh, that all the good things I saw in her from that date and that if she was reading this, then there was only one thing left to do. So I wrote this with the intention in the future to give her this letter and to propose to her. And uh, well, a year and a half later, I did give her that letter and she read it. And then I got down on my knee and I proposed. And... <laughs> That's great. That's exactly how it happened. Yes. yes. What, what was that first date like for you? It was almost the same thing. On my way home, I had called my cousin because again, like you said, meeting online mm -hmm. wasn't exactly the norm back in 2006. And so my cousin was making sure that I was okay and mm -hmm. everything went well. And I called her. It wasn't a creep. <laughs> that it wasn't weird. <laughs> and I said, no, I, I think this is going to be good. I remember telling her, I'm like, this is going to be good. This is going to be big. Mm. 
And so I didn't know what that meant. Right. I didn't know what it was going to lead to, but I just knew it was going to lead to something big. So awesome. we obviously both had that feeling. Yeah. Well, let's, let's set that aside and let's then back up in our lives. Cause that's where everyone who's looking at this vocation of marriage wants to get to, you know, the, the meeting that person, the falling in love, the, the proposing, and then um, getting married. But go back to your childhood and, and think about when and, you know, why did you first start thinking like, one day I think I want to get married. Like, this is, this is what I want. This is a life goal. Maybe this is what God wants for me. Where did that come from that you would actually want to go so far as to get on a dating app and try to find somebody? For me, um, you know, I have eight siblings. So my mom and dad, you know, uh, married, had a lot of kids. So I saw their marriage and then I saw uh, my older siblings start to get married. And uh, so I, I probably would have been around, I don't know, nine, 10, 11, somewhere in that okay. range yeah. uh, when they started getting married. Then they had started having kids and stuff. I guess I've just always been drawn towards that and wanted to yeah. Wanted that for myself, I guess. Saw the beauty of yeah. marriage and family, how they were having kids and that looked kind of neat and fun maybe. And uh, Yeah, and my, my parents, again, I go back to their example. They've been married 58 years now. Wow. So and, and the love uh, that they have for each other, again, it wasn't always perfect. No marriage is always perfect. There's ups and downs and everything. But seeing them work through all that and uh, to raise nine kids and the chaos, um and that they still stuck together through it all. So yeah. how about for you, Jenny? I wasn't as young as Joe was. I knew I did want to have kids when I was younger. I grew up not around a lot of siblings, but around a lot of cousins. Mm. So I was around a lot of kids, a lot of babies, uh, loved being one of the older cousins and helping to take care of the babies, mm. to sure. play with the toddlers and everything. So I always knew that that was something I was going to eventually want. As you get older, you realize obviously that coincides with marriage. Right. It wasn't really anything that was discussed or maybe like talked about in our house, like the type of spouse you would want to seek out. Mm. That wasn't something that was really brought up. I had a very different upbringing than Joe did. Again, I only had a sister and I had a stepbrother. But also my senior year of high school is when my parents actually ended up getting divorced. Mm. So it wasn't really until after that that I really thought about marriage because not just on what it probably did for my parents, but then what it also did for the children too. So I wanted to make sure that when I did find the one, that was what it was going to be. It was going to be the one I did not want. I want to go through what my parents went through. If hopefully we had kids, we did not make them go through that as well. So I needed to know going into it that this was going to be a, a person who was going to stick by my side and that we were going to go through all of those ups and downs together, no matter what. Yeah. You bring out the other side, there's uh, a lot of us, it's a mixed bag of any vocational discernment. We have fears based on wounded experiences, bad experiences in our, in our life, in our childhood that makes us wonder, do I really want this? Could I really do this? Am I just going to be another statistic, especially as we see the divorce rate just rise and rise and we just kind of honestly wonder to ourselves, can I have a successful marriage? It, it looks hard. And, and maybe that's why we don't see as many people, young people getting married, discerning and, and courageously going into uh, marriage with the, the right intentions even. Or, but the, the joys too, that there, there's all these great aspects of, of what I want and, and what I'm looking for. And sometimes we can even feel like maybe we're going into it selfishly, like Marriage and family is to serve me and, and my wants and my needs, and it's meant to make me happy. But both of you have kind of grown into a place where you know, like this other person, God didn't make them to make me like happy to put them on earth for that reason, or even my children uh, for that matter as well. So for both of you, what were some of the, you already mentioned a little bit, Jenny, of the, the fears of coming out of a, a divorced family. Um, what were some of the other fears about 
getting married, uh, what you're looking for, how did you overcome them or what were some of the, the joys that attracted to you? How did you kind of say, okay, well, I, I can't enter this selfishly or naively thinking holding a baby is always going to make me happy <laughs> sort of thing. I think some of the fears, which I, I think probably every married person, actually probably every priest even, enters their vocation has this fear of uh, it's meant to last till death do us part. So that's a fear. I mean, for everyone, like, am I capable of living out this vocation t- to the end? But also a fear of when times get tough, you know, am I going to be able to stick it out and, right. you know, so th- those are the things that, and when you start having kids, I, I guess I've just learned slowly that you just have to let go sometimes. It's letting go and knowing that things will work out. Maybe not how I always want or how I planned, but right. that God has a plan. And even though I can't see it right now, uh, I just have to trust. So, Right. One thing I always talk to couples about when we're doing marriage prep, getting ready for their wedding, I'll ask them the question, how did you fall in love? And and usually they're not quite as eloquent as you guys and, and your story. But what I tell them in the end is they kind of are trying to put their finger on it is one, it's not that easy to do, uh, to know why. I'm called to this vocation and to this particular person. But it's John Henry Cardinal Newman who said, if you took a cinder block and you tied a string to that cinder block and you tried to pick it up, the string would snap. But if you took 50, 75, 100 strings and you tied them securely to the cinder block and you hoisted them as a unit, you'd be able to bear the burden. You'd move the cinder block. I say the cinder block is the burden of love, the commitment to this relationship. It's not just one one or two things, a great first date, you know, beautiful eyes, um, a great, charming personality. Those are strings, and on their own, they're not enough to hoist that unit. You have to, you have to conjure up a ton of them, fastening them to that commitment so that you can hoist the burden of love to where it needs to go at any time in our life, especially when the storms of life kind of come through. And so, like as a priest, I'm constantly coming back to the the movements in my heart, in my life, as to what made me know God was gently speaking to me, yes, I want you to follow this vocation. I want you to become a diocesan priest. And I'm sure for, for you as well, like there's so many things that you can kind of go to and say, Yes, I called me to this and to this person and to this life together. And so I'm committed to this relationship. And finding that for all of us is important. Mm -hmm. It is continuous. It isn't just the discerning up until the actual wedding or the actual marriage. It's constant. You always have to constantly wake up and remember what you chose, what you did discern and go forth that day with the other person and the life that you've built. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and coming to a, a, a surety that this is what, what God desires for me. So what about as you were getting ready, you know, where, where was kind of God and, and where was prayer in this piece of it for you guys? Joe actually brought me a bit back more into my Catholic faith. He Mm -hmm. did challenge me in ways to really look more in depth. And he still continues to challenge me. Which is what a good, strong marriage should be about. You challenge each other. We do always um, remind each other. And we even tell our kids, too, that marriage is about giving the other person to heaven. Mm, That that's our ultimate goal. Um, it's our ultimate goal with our kids. So that is something that we do build our foundation basically of our marriage on. Um, That's what helps us through all of those tough times. One way that I brought God into it. So as I told you, again, I'm a hopeless romantic and I always kind of wanted to find the one I was going to marry and have a wife. And that's probably why, you know, as I had trouble meeting <laughs> girl. I was not meeting them, but uh, having relationships with them because I probably scared a lot of girls off. I uh, I read something in a book is by Jason Everett. What I took from it was 
uh, I started again writing letters. This is before I met Jenny to my future wife, because, like I said, I had this strong desire to get married, and so I wanted to provide a gift for her. So when, like, when I was lonely and times were tough, I I'd, I'd write a letter to my future wife, and so I I think that was inspired by the Holy Spirit and by God to do that. And, and that's almost a prayer in, in and of itself in a lot of ways. It's almost like a little bit of a journaling, but it's it's invite invitation of your future spouse into the conversation you're having with God. Yes. So over, I think it was like a six-year period, I wrote I don't know, 12 or 13 letters, and I ended up giving those to Jenny on our uh, wedding night. So Yeah, no, that's beautiful. Did uh, did you ever consider another vocation or did like people ever say, oh, did you ever think about priesthood, Joe? Uh, and how did you rule that out? Um, it's actually funny because it's something that's been a discussion recently because somebody actually brought up to Joe that he would be a great deacon. But it's actually something I've thought about for Joe before. I don't know if he's ever thought about, really thought about it. But right now in our state of life, mm-hmm probably not a possibility at the moment. We're very knee deep in the raising of children Mm -hmm. and the day-to-day life with our jobs and everything. But it is something that I've actually prayed about a little bit for Joe because he's a very passionate person about his faith. Yeah, let's go back to the original (laughs) question though. When you were a young man, Joe, did anybody ever say, oh, you'd make a great priest, you know, don't think about marriage, you should pursue that? i do believe when I was at Ritter, someone may have uh, made some point about that, but I don't know that I ever gave it serious thought just because I was in my own, like, I want to get married. Yeah. Some people might feel guilty about that, having that same kind of experience right now. Like, oh, I'm not, am I giving enough attention to all the vocations? Because you do have to actively go after one. Um And God puts something on your heart. And just because people suggest something doesn't mean that necessarily you need to throw yourself into it and maybe go to seminary necessarily, especially when uh, something else is very strong kind of on your heart. Uh, St. Augustine said, love and then do what you will. So long as you're trying to pursue the Lord and follow him, doesn't mean you need to uh, not pursue what's kind of on your heart. I, I've run into people where people think God just wants the hardest thing for me. And that's not necessarily true. God wants good things for us and he puts the things on our hearts that we should pursue. So complicating, mudding the waters is not always necessary. It's not like you got to like actively rule out priesthood. Just the fact that it was so strong in your heart. When I think about advice that I could give towards parents when it comes to vocations. I'm taking this from also how I was raised. We didn't talk about marriage. We didn't talk about even the possibility of becoming a sister, or Mm -hmm. we didn't talk about that in our house. And I think that that is something that you should do with your kids. Yeah, Make it common, Mm -hmm. um, not uncomfortable, the possibilities that are actually out there talk about marriage because as we have our oldest now who's 14 Mm -hmm. she's getting to the age where eventually she is going to start dating well i want her to understand that you're not just dating you're looking for your future husband you're if that is something that you are considering you want to look at that person and think is this who i might want to spend the rest of my life with is this who i want to help bring me to heaven i know that might seem weird when you're a teenager, but to make it just common and also to give her the confidence that her time is worth that because I wish somebody would have sat down with me Mm -hmm. and went through that when I was younger to really be like, you're not just dating to have fun. You're not just dating to be like, oh, I've got a date this Friday or I've got a date to prom. I feel good because I'm popular enough to have a date sort of thing. That's a common mentality these days. But something I see that you guys are doing too, and maybe you're not aware of it, is 
your exposure to your kids of the saints. And we are blessed to live in a day and age where there are so many saints that are married and that are living different vocations than just priests and, and religious. I think of St. Saint, uh, Tr- saint Therese's parents, St. Zaley and Louis Martin. What an example they are. And just giving kids even the exposure to these saints who lived the vocation of marriage and getting them into that idea and that mindset that marriage is a vocation Mm -hmm. towards sainthood. And to even give them exposure to the other possibilities, like for boys, altar serving, Mm -hmm. that's their first exposure. For girls, I would even think a possible sacristan Mm -hmm. or just you know, like teaching them about the other various monasteries that are out there. Like there's so much out there that is a possibility for them to really see what their life might be like in the future. It doesn't have to be marriage. If they are really truly discerning the possibility of religious life or priesthood, we want to give them the opportunity to start searching that out. Plus, you don't want them to discover these other vocations and feel like they're running from them. Yes. uh, So one thing I try to do, I have three girls and then our youngest, Leo, with the boy. But with girls, especially, is to let them know that that I love them as their father Mm. and that they're beautiful. Because if I'm not telling them that, uh, when someone else tells them that, especially a boy, it's going to mean a lot more to them if they're not hearing it from me. And then they may, you know, go down paths that they shouldn't go down just because they're getting that attention and uh, perceived love that they weren't getting from me. So I try to do that just to hopefully if they they do are discerning, you know, dating and marriage and all that, that they can actually discern someone who has their best interest in art and who loves them for them. Um, I do tell the girls as much as they roll their eyes at me at times, you want to find somebody like your dad. Mm. You want to find somebody who, number one, loves God, Mm -hmm. loves you, and loves the life that you're building. They always roll their (laughs) eyes at me when I say this, but I'm like, trust me, that's who you're going to want to find. That's beautiful. Well, thank you so much for joining us and talking about your vocational discernment, some great ideas for parents who are trying to help their kids in vocational discernment, especially towards the the vocation of marriage. It is a vocation. It's a call to holiness. It's something we should be actively thinking about if we're discerning our vocation and going to the good Lord in all things. So until next time, keep living the clover life. You've been listening to Living the Clover Life. For more information about St. Malachi Catholic Parish, check out our website at stmalachy.org, S-T-M-A-L-A-C-H-Y.org.